The Spirit in the Body by Robert Crosby. Letter 6. The Spirit shown in your letters makes me glad for all of us. Well, you have made a beginning, and in the right way, as it appears to me. While your audience was small, that part you are not responsible for. Such things are judged by the effort made and not by the apparent results, the latter belong to the law and will be felt in time, as surely as effects follow causes. We should remember that it is harder to make a beginning in a large city than in a small one, it takes harder and longer shouting to reach those scattered in a big population, but the results should be much greater in time. Also, no matter who come, it is certain that each one will talk to others who never come, and will get whatever impression is made on the attendant. It is said that each person who hears will in time repeat something to one thousand others. This statement may be arbitrary, but the number is doubtless large that can be touched in this way, so, the radius is not to be reckoned entirely by numbers present, even on this plane of action. This by way of encouragement, not that you need it, but that it is well to bear in mind the wider range of action of all such work, and that we are not alone. An iconoclast of any well-recognized system can obtain crowded houses, but a builder gets the few, a commentary on the human mind as at present constituted. It also reminds me of Mr. Judge's saying, Theosophy is for those who want it and for none others. One phrase in your pamphlet, the search for the ultimate, should give a keynote and encouragement. I quote from memory, there are those who may not have outwardly renounced, but they have inwardly relinquished, and would gladly welcome the time when the non-essentials are swept away that the essentials may obtain. The fact that they have that attitude which would welcome the sweeping away of the non-essentials shows the inner relinquishment. Sometimes it happens that a student passes through a portal without knowing that he is doing so, or has done so, until he finds himself on the other side. He knows then that other and greater portals await him, and he passes them in like manner, growing, 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 with no thought of anything but service to the best and highest he knows. I am glad the bad week has gone into the limbo of such things, for it makes another opening and a rising cycle is a good time to make further effort. Such experiences come to all humans, they also go, as we know, and in this we are more fortunate than the world at large. It is the knowledge of the transitory nature of all experiences, while experiencing, that enables us to remain separate from them. I establish this whole universe with a single portion of myself and remain separate. The macrocosmic truth must also be the true position to be attained by the microcosm in his realm of creation. Sometimes, as you say, one gets into the way of doing things perfunctorily, this has been found to result from the mind being on other things, things other than the work in hand. The remedy, of course, lies in the redirecting of the mind and concentrating on that which is done. Our daily lives give us the best opportunities for the practice of concentration, and for increase of knowledge by making theosophy a living power in our lives. You speak of control. Control is the power of direction, and when exercised in one way, leads to its exercise in other ways until it covers the whole field of operation. A way to control speech is to think of the probable effect of what one is about to say. This ensures deliberation, and the speech carries with it the force of the intention. The deliberation takes no appreciable time in practice, a thought towards it, a glance at effects, it is really an attitude of purposive speech wherein all the processes are practically simultaneous. If in any one thing control is difficult, begin with the purpose of control in mind, and stop at the first indication that control is being lost. Everything should be made subservient to the idea of control, if that is the purpose. The great renunciation is made up of little self-denials. Who, indeed can deny the master admission to his house, 
and who can enter the house of the strong man and spoil his goods unless the strong man be first bound hand and foot, and again, who can bind him but his lawful vassals who dwell in his house, and who can restrain these but the master of the house? To be master, we must have control, in all things pertaining to our kingdom or house, if we are swayed by impatience, by irritation at the words and acts of others, by impulse, habit of mind or body, we are not in control. We frequently are thus swayed, while knowing better, which indicates that we have not gone to work in earnest to obtain control, or perhaps in the wrong way. Applying analogy, it would seem that the latter consists in the modern method of proceeding from particulars to universals, and that the process should be reversed. We would then begin with the idea, attitude, and purpose of control in all things that concern the vassals of our house. The advance would then be all along the line, and the habit of control established, the balance preserved. It sums itself up in my mind as the establishment of control itself, irrespective of the things controlled. The attack in detail is the other way, but seems to me to have the disadvantage of being open to disturbance from the rest of the details while assaulting any one point. General control might lose his title, and even his name in the melee. Each warrior, however, having in view the forces and disposition of the enemy, must make his own fight in the way that seems to him best.